Growing up, I was always afraid of taking the same path as my brother. I watched him go from suspension to incarceration. It was really hard on my family, both financially and emotionally. Our criminal justice system ends up being a pipeline from underfunded, inadequate schools to overcrowded jails. 70% of students arrested by law enforcement in school are black or Latino. 68% of all men in state and federal prison have not had the chance to graduate from high school. The question is, but how do we make sure that those same kind of institutional supports are there for kids and teenagers before they get into the criminal justice system? In 2014, the U.S. Attorney General sent a letter to every public school in the country, stating that suspension is now a civil rights issue. This is an opportunity to change things, to create a different path for the next generation of students of color. Justice is making sure every young person knows they are special and they are important and that their lives matter. Justice is giving every child a shot at a great education no matter what zip code they're born into. At this time, the bailiff will swear in the respondent. Dennis, would you please walk over to the witness stand and when you get there, remain standing and raise your right hand. To have someone forgive me would be like giving me another chance and respecting that I messed up. And also them realizing that it was my mistake and that I could learn from it. A sense of one's belonging and a sense of one's uh, importance or significance in the family, in a work setting or a community is huge. I'm unwilling to share who I am with you based on the experiences I've had that have led me to a position not to believe that this world cares about me, my issues, my challenges, but the worst thing, this world doesn't care about my dreams. One suspension in middle school for a kid of color is the highest predictor of them not completing school. A suspension in high school is a very high predictor of them being involved with the juvenile justice system. I remember living in this apartment in like, in Centerfell. It was me and my two brothers, they're both older. In elementary school, I remember I always wanted to be a veterinarian. <laughs> I always wanted to help animals. And actually last summer I got an internship at a pet hospital, but I kind of realized it wasn't really my thing. I grew up without a dad for the most part. When we were little, I remember he used to deal with the problems we had in our family violently. I remember this one time we got in a fight with Carlos. Um, Carlos was drunk and my brother was around like 13 maybe. Um, I remember it was getting kind of physical and my mom had to stop it. Um, I just sat there on the stairs watching because I was too young to do anything. I just feel uh, anybody at any age can really use a mentor, somebody to look up to. So it was very impactful on me. I had a very positive experience growing up, and I really feel uh, the more solid relationships that you make with individuals in our community, the more effective you are at serving a community. If I had that male authority figure, I feel like I'd have someone who I can like count on like 24-7. feel like I'm never alone, and that I could always ask for help. Someone to look up to, to know, like, hey, I can be this when I grow up. I have a great family uh, and have been blessed with eight brothers and sisters. It provided me with a sense of confidence that if we stuck together as a family unit, we had a chance to raise the ability of all of us to be successful. And my mom, at a point, she worked two jobs, one during the day and one during the night. So I didn't really see much of her. I feel like she tried to do her best to like keep our family like balanced, but it was hard being a single parent. I'd say growing up, I kind of did idolize my brother, Ricardo. I mean, I was the little brother and he was the big brother. He was like the main influence for me because my dad wasn't there. But then like after he got into problems with drinking and um, I kind of distanced myself from him. He was good in school academically, I would say until like seventh grade or eighth grade maybe. I remember he got suspended once in like middle school and that's kind of when it started. I think he was sent to placement 
That's like when they send you to kind of like juvie, but like really far away. He started getting more involved into gangs, and I saw him like bringing baggy clothes with like gang colors on them, and the group of friends he was hanging out with, and how he'd come home drunk. I saw how he changed, definitely, from like when we were little to this teenage Ricardo phase. It was during school, and I decided I needed some weed for after school, so I asked one of my friends, and we went like across the street from school. I thought it was gonna be like a simple transaction, but he decided to go with like a group of people, and we got busted that way because we we're like in an apartment across the street from school. One of the transitions in juvenile justice now are that we know that young people do not have the full capacity of their brain until they're about 25. The frontal lobe's not hooked up, and that's where the executive decision-making comes from. Young people tend to make decisions from the limbic part of their brain, which is the emotional part. We have learned now that when a young person says, I don't know why I did that, they're not lying, they're not trying to cover it up. That's just a limbic decision from the brain that's based on an emotional, spontaneous response. It's not thought through. I spent like an hour in the office just worrying like, okay, what is my mom gonna say? And um, they sent me home. My mom started like yelling at me and like, telling me how, how much I messed up and how I'm like putting more stress on her added to like what Ricardo did. In school, I got punished. I got three days of in-school suspension. So that basically means I get to spend my time sitting in an office doing nothing for six hours each day for three days. Instead of having my time spent learning something or in a classroom, I basically get to stare at a wall or the clock for six hours. All the data shows that if kids aren't in school, they're not gonna get what they need to be successful academically, socially, and then in life. The best thing we can do, I think, is develop the strategies that keep kids in school. I thought I was gonna be dealing with probation, so I was kind of scared because I didn't want to have a record. If they don't have uh, alternatives to detention or alternatives to a criminal justice system that can be all-encompassing and collapsing on, on an individual, that person may get caught up uh, with a record and get deeper and deeper into the criminal justice system and not find a way out. Youth Court's a court run by kids for kids, but it's highly effective because it's positive peer pressure. Our peer court is based on restorative principles, so kids find it uh, supportive rather than punitive. Hello, members of the jury. I want to thank you for your service in this case tonight, and I want to remind you briefly that we practice restorative justice here. Uh, this means we're trying to do two things here. First, we're trying to obviously repair any harm that's been done to the community. That's sort of the justice part of restorative justice. At the same time, though, we're also trying to help the respondent reflect upon his actions and make better choices in the future. And also, we want to make sure the respondent feels reincorporated into the community. This is the restorative part of restorative justice. So there's definitely a difference between peer court and youth court. Peer court actually takes place within the school setting. However, if a student is involved in an illegal action, then that situation would go to the youth court system, whereby the youth court actually happens in a, quote, courtroom located at the juvenile hall site. And so just by definition, you can see the difference in terms of the seriousness of um, the two different settings. Dennis, you do solemnly swear that what you're about to say in the case now pending before this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, you may be seated. At this time, Dennis, you may tell the peer jury about the violation. It really focuses on the needs of the whole child versus a punishment for a particular crime. The young person has to admit accountability for the crime. Let's talk about the harm that is created to other members of the community, and let's start addressing that. Was it your mother that was harmed? Was it the local neighborhood that was harmed? Who have you harmed, and what should we do about that? And collectively come up with some type of agreement that we all feel good about, and then the child has a better understanding of the significance of their actions. In youth court, you, you tell your story to a group of people around your age, and they kind of ask you questions like why you did it, how's your family life, and what activities do you do, just to see if you're involved in the community or, you know, just to get a sense of who you are. Okay, so everything we know about 
Education in the 21st century involves communicating, critical thinking, collaborating, and being creative. And that is in direct alignment with all the work um, related to the restorative practices. He seems like he's pretty motivated to make change in his life. And I think that jury duties would be a really beneficial to him because he can see what other uh, people have gone through as well. And I think he uh, community service hours will really help him broaden his horizons and gain new opportunities. After that, they like give you a sentence and I got the minimum sentence of two jury duties and 15 hours of community service. I got to meet other people that were in like similar situations as me and it was pretty interesting. Working here at the garden, it's like, it's really supportive. Knowing that a group of people are still working for like the community, it shows how people can come together to like accomplish something. Helping this community, it actually means a lot. I really like being part of that. Before I went, I thought I was going to be dealing with probation, but when I met Don and he explained everything to me, it was a relief. Like, I realized I won't be having to deal with this for job resumes. Like, they won't be looking into my past and seeing that I got sent to probation. If a child gets arrested, and is referred to youth court and completes youth court, we'll advocate for that child to have his record sealed. That means you can lawfully answer all questions into the future. Have you ever been arrested before? And you could lawfully say no. That record does not exist anymore. It is way more effective than how schools are handling their situations through like suspension. I felt it was way more effective on teenagers because it makes you feel like grown-ups especially haven't given up on you. You're still part of the community and you don't have to deal with it on your record so it doesn't interfere with college or jobs. Youth who are suspended or expelled from school, and by the way, these youth are disproportionately young people of color, are at a greater risk of ending up with a criminal record and in prison later on in life hence the term school to prison pipeline. I don't think this is right. People should not be punished for their entire lives with the stigma of a criminal record for mistakes they made when they were young. That's why at the Marin County Youth Court, we're pioneering innovative alternatives to the traditional justice system to repair harm that's been done to the community while also providing support to young people. It is a pleasure to be here to celebrate YMCA Marin Youth Court on its 10th anniversary. And I say that not only as Chief Justice of California and all of my concern about the safety and public welfare of our youth and our adults, but also as a mother. And so this youth court, I think, holds such an incredible promise. And you've already fulfilled that promise with your 900 students who've been diverted, your lack of recidivism, your 95th percent success rate in the program. Those numbers are unheard of. They are unprecedented numbers in criminal justice. We could take this program and your commitment and your leadership and replicate it across the 58 counties. If we could replicate it, this is criminal realignment. This is where it starts. This is the solution to California's problems with public safety and prison overcrowding and criminal justice. It is the seed of a program like this. I think that um, a strong leader has to uh, be willing to take risks that might be unpopular in the way that the YMCA, uh, Don Carney and others have taken the leadership related to the youth court, the restorative practices. That was important so that somebody like me could take the time to learn, Members of the jury, your uh, to wonder, in this case has to ask included. questions, and court then to uh, join in this important work. Is it going to better the community? Is it going to be good for the organization? Is it going to serve the public? And so sometimes you have to step out of your box and just say, what feels right and what's working for the kids? And to put kids in the same room and hold each other accountable is often much more meaningful than any parent or probation officer can have on a child. That is a healthier way to resolve conflict than our normal criminal justice system. So after I got in trouble, my mom was telling me how I was gonna end up like my brother because I'm starting to get in trouble like he was. And I thought she lost hope in me. But after youth court, I've kind of realized I'm not gonna be like my brother. I know I'm different and I know I've got a different path ahead of me. 
stop suspending kids for small behaviors and sending them home for three days. It doesn't address any of the issues. Have kids stay in school and offer some type of restorative justice model to address the behavior and address the harm that it caused and build in some type of accountability. It's kind of twisted because teenagers are like the most vulnerable people and like it's just so hard to see how people kind of mistreat them. Youth Court kind of showed that we do have some allies. Two years ago, during my sophomore year, I got in trouble with um, marijuana on school campus. That's when I kind of thought, wow, I'm actually going to end up like my brother. My, my mom was right, everyone was right, my life is going the wrong direction. But then I met Don, and I got involved into youth court, and I realized there's just like so much to do with the community, and it really helped me. Two weeks ago, I actually got accepted into Chico, and... Um, <laughs> He said he was holding that surprise till this moment for me. That's kind of like when I thought, wow, I'm actually going the right way now. I'm not going to end up like my brother. First thing I did when I opened the certificate, I went up to my mom and was like, you know what this is? She was like, what? I was like, I just got it accepted into college. We hugged each other. We were so happy. And I, I realized she was proud of me. Yeah, it's a one day, it's a special day for today.